freedom, a concept so fundamental and yet so simple, we often take it entirely for granted. Freedom allows civilizations to flourish in the arts and the sciences, it provides a melting pot where cultures from every corner of the globe can come together under a single identity. It's the idea that allows people not only to redefine the real, but also to perfect it, and in its absence, it seems we would stop at nothing to obtain it. It may come as something of a surprise then, that the foundations of this idea, and indeed of many of the aspects of what we've come to define Western civilization, actually began over 2,000 years ago, with a group of people so ambitious and so influential that they quite literally changed the world. The Greeks, in the centuries since their decline, has become almost fashionable for Western society to compare themselves with the ancient Greeks. The marks of their art and architecture can still be seen today. If you were an inhabitant of Greece in the 5th century BC, you were essentially at the cultural hub of the world. An alphabet had been introduced, which gave rise to a multitude of Greek poems, including the famous epics, telling fantastical tales of heroes and gods. This was an age where mind was being based over matter, the time of the philosopher, which gave rise to the likes of Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. In fact, it's fair to say that the Greeks went on to set the standard of excellence for Western civilization. And if you take a look at what they left behind, it isn't hard to see why. But for me, the most significant novelty of this period of Greece was its political system. One whose ideology accepted the freedom to think, to believe, and to express oneself, an ideology known today as democracy. The Greek word from which it is derived is demokratia, from demos meaning people and kratos meaning rule or power, so it really was power to the people. All of these features were encapsulated by a single word in classical Greek, to hellenikon, meaning the Greekness or the Greek thing. And if you want to get a feel for what this word really means, the Parthenon wouldn't be a bad place to start. The Parthenon was a temple dedicated to the goddess Athena, the patron deity of Athens, and it was situated at the very heart of the city, on what was known as the Acropolis, some of whose statues, but sadly not Athena's, survive. But it was more than just a place of worship. It was a celebration of the city's wealth and its political status. It set them apart from what they believed was the lowest of the low, the enemies of civilization, their complete polar opposites, the barbarians. These metopias or metopes, which would have adorned the south side of the building, are a perfect example of how Greek mythology was used to signify their core beliefs. In this case, the intense opposition to chaos and disorder. The story goes something like this. There was once a group of humans known as the Lapids, who were celebrating a wedding. However, deciding that no party would be complete without a half man half horse, they decided to invite a group of centaurs. Now, the centaurs overindulged in all the free wine of the party, and in the state of intoxication, attacked all the human hosts and made off with their women, as you do. These meetups depict the battle that ensued. Now, in all of these meetups, it's difficult to discern who exactly the victor was, except for in one in particular, to which I'd like to draw your attention. This centaur stands triumphant over the body of a defeated Lapith, his head lying lifeless to one side. In stark contrast to the elegant cloaks of the humans, the centaur has the skin of a panther draped over his arm to emphasize his feral tendencies. Although it has been broken out, we can just about make out the remains of a wine mixing bowl which the centaur would be holding, a symbol of hospitality and good faith a symbol which the central is seemingly using to clock his house to death. Now while it's easy for us to say that these sculptures would have been placed upon the temple wall as an appropriate dedication to the royal goddess Athena, we must be very careful in attributing a single meaning to ancient art, as this may not have been in the mind of the artist. If you look at the etymology of the word barbarian, and the history behind the building of the Parthenon itself, it seems there may have been an underlying political message. The word barbarian wasn't always associated with uncivilized beings. In fact, the word derives from Sanskrit's barbara, meaning stutterer. 
Now you're probably wondering what the connection is between a stashwa and a savage brute. Well, the Greek form of the word, barbaros, was used to mean anyone foreign, the connection being that both stratovers and foreigners used unintelligible speech, thereby making both of them outsiders, which is what the word really meant. But following the invasion of the Persians in 480 BC and the sacking of the sacred acropolis of Athens, the word barbaros, previously used even to denote the Egyptians who served by the Greeks, became synonymous with Persian. The Parthenon is, without a doubt, a masterpiece of the ancient world and a testimony to Athenian craftsmanship and innovation. But it's also easy for us to assume that Greek society in the ancient world was something of a utopia, free of the faults and flaws that would have preceded it. Indeed, it's the story of one individual in particular which sheds light upon something rather sinister that lay behind the mask of democracy. Meet Socrates, who lived from 470 to 399 BC. Although he may not look it, he was something of a celebrity among the youths of Athens, and is sometimes heard as the pioneer of Greek philosophy, tutoring the likes of Plato and Xenophon. He was even decreed to be the wisest of all men by the oracle of Delphi. A champion of education, he would often hold profound discussions with the Athenian youths on the subjects of morality, justice and virtue. It would seem then that Socrates was the perfect emblem for this concept of term and energy, having taken full advantage of an age where the philosopher was given the stage. Why was it then that this society which seemingly encouraged freedom of thought, one which he epitomised, would eventually lead to his own execution? Following the events of the Peloponnesian War in which Athens suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of the Spartans and their allies, Socrates began to question the way in which his city-state was being run. He'd made no secret of his political stance in the past, often criticising democracy openly, but his appreciation of the totalitarian system of the Spartans, the bitter enemies of the city to which he claimed allegiance, did not exactly play to his favour. The spurned Athenians charged him with two things, corrupting the minds of the youth of Athens and not believing in the gods of state. He was trialled, found guilty of heresy, and eventually killed in 399 BC. Was this simply the case of a man letting his pride get the better of him? Or was there something else entirely at work here? A primordial fear which, in one way or another, has manifested itself within every great civilization? To explore this further, we're going to have to turn towards a civilization thought to have inspired the Greeks themselves, a people who were born from the chaos and confusion that came with the collapse of the Bronze Age, and whose empire was baptized in blood, the ironclad warriors themselves, the Assyrians. From the many friezes on display here at the British Museum, I think we can gather that the Assyrians had a rather different approach to foreign policy than the ancient Greeks. And by different, I mean captured, conquered, or kill anyone or anything in sight. Between the 23rd and the 6th centuries BC, Assyria would grow to become a mighty empire fueled by conquest and war, ruled by a succession of kings whose most endearing quality had nothing to do with wisdom or justice, but instead on how much fear they could incite in their enemies, as seen here in the Black Obelisk. This is essentially a glorification of King Sulmanu Asaredu III's military achievements, showing the spoils of war which the Assyrians won from their neighbours in the form of exotic animals. We can see here, for example, camels and an elephant. We even see the King of Israel bowing before the supposed might of Assyria. It seems to me that while Greek sculpture was used more for the purpose of portraying mythical tales, Assyrian artefacts tend to boast real events as a record of their successes and as an expression of their power. Power? It seems from what we've seen, that power in the world of the ancient Greeks belonged much more to the gods. The Parthenon, after all, was a dedication not to any ruler, but to a goddess. So what role did the gods play in the politics of the Assyrian Empire? To answer that question, we're going to have to look at this drama leaf here from around 860 BC, from the throne room of King Ashurnasirapali II. The Tree of Life at the centre of this relief is surrounded on either side by the same king appearing twice. Clearly the man thought a lot of himself. He is portrayed 
as it seems, to be in control of life itself, a sure symbol of his power and fertility. But if you look at the centre of the tree, we can see a god, and we may infer from this that the Assyrians were made to believe that their ruler was given a god-given rights to be in power, that he was the source of abundance provided by the gods, and protected by winged spirits, as we can see on either side of the king. So imagine what it would have been like to visit King Ashur II in about 860 BC, having been confronted by two human-headed winged beasts outside. You would then come face to face with not one, but three versions of the king, two on either side of me as protected by winged spirits, and a third and final real king seated where I'm standing right now as protected by the god. It is then very interesting to compare the Greeks with the Assyrians. Signs of Assyrian inspiration can clearly be seen in the Parthenon's friezes, the design of which seems in some cases to be merely a more protrusive version of the Assyrians. But as far as the political systems of Assyria and 5th century BC Greece are concerned, there seems to be one fundamental difference. The role of the gods. In Assyria, the belief that gods were associated with the kings was essential in order for the people to see reason in living under a monarchy. Whereas as part of the Athenian democracy, citizens could vote on legislation in their own right, there was no need even for elected representatives, let alone gods. Despite this, there is one thing which brings together the civilizations of the Assyrians and the Greeks. It's the reason, ultimately, why Socrates was led to his execution, and why the Assyrians felt the need to display themselves as fierce, powerful, and successful warriors. It's the incessant fear, inherent in every society, of being overthrown or replaced by something different, something menacing, something new. Everyone, everywhere we look, everywhere we turn, is driven by emotions. And from what we've seen, it seems that fear is perhaps the strongest of these motivators. Or is it?